You'll recall uh, that we're talking about L-napples and D-napples, light, lighter than water, non-aqueous fluids, denser than non-aqueous fluids, or non-aqueous fluids. And our interest so far has been to kind of figure out exactly where they will get to in the first few months, what their distribution will look like, what are the processes and uh, parameters that control that, uh, that distribution. And so we've seen that in terms of where they go, it's a, basically a battle between gravity, which is the only driving force which puts them in place, and interfacial forces which retain them. Work, one works against the other one. And it defines uh, what they can penetrate through in terms of the size of pore throats or the size of fractures. Um, and we've used a couple of quite important concepts. And those important concepts have been this uh, concept of a capillary pressure versus saturation diagram. And we've taken to drawing them on top of each other. And relative permeability versus saturation diagrams uh, with these no-go areas. We've used a consistent uh, terminology, I think, in terms of water saturation and, I guess, non-wetting saturation. I have to think that my writing, handwriting, is just fantastic. Um, And uh, these define very straightforwardly the behaviors in drying and in imbibition relative to these uh, no-go areas, which are what? This is, so this is the maximum amount of water you can get out of the system. So this is the irreducible water saturation, and this is the irreducible non-wetting saturation. And we've drawn these other diagrams in a variety of different ways. Let's, for just simplicity, draw them this way. For relative permeability, I didn't label the axes. This is relative permeability, and this is between 0 and 1. And this has to be for the wetting phase, because it's 100% when it's 100% water filled, and this one has to be for the non-wetting phase. And so those are key diagrams that allow us to, to define saturations and ultimately define throughputs of uh, fluid in these. So I thought I would use those today to kind of introduce um, the concept of if we think that we have these non-aqueous phase liquids held in, in place so they can't get out, and so it's this whole idea of this residual chimney or trail that we'd have. This is the water table. This has to be a Dean apple, right, because it's gone through the water table and kept on going. It's only stopped where it's either seen some capillary barriers or a big capillary barrier at the bottom. I guess I drew this sort of no, I don't want to do that. And uh, our views of behavior could be that if we wanted to look at the rate at which this was moving, we're saying it's, it's not going to physically move in terms of changing its saturation. But one way that you could imagine getting the, uh, the red stuff out of the ground would be by passing either under natural gradients a flow through the system, in which case now we're probably in a condition to be able to calculate exactly what rates we could move as a function of the dissolved plume. Because now we have a way of, one, being able to calculate what this distribution of NAPL will be as we go down from the water table. So that's the first thing we can do. The second thing is that once we have it uh, calculated in terms of the saturation, we have a way of being able to figure out what the relative permeability would be. And if we know what the relative permeability in the gradient is, then we can say something about the flow of water through the system, even though the red fluid probably isn't going to be moving at all. And if we know what the flow of water through the system is, then we can say something about the amount of dissolved component that would come out of it. And so we've actually 
reached a stage where we can probably do something at least a, a little bit useful. So let's do that. Let's do exactly that. I was going to do it in a different order, but let's, let's do exactly that today. All right, I think we're 2-6. And um, I guess again, nondescript multi phase phone. So we draw the same diagram we had before. We have a water table. We have a capillary barrier, just sitting here. Um, we have a, a chimney of this stuff sitting on top of the capillary barrier. And this is our dean apple that's sitting in the bottom. So this is a I think my handwriting is fantastic today. And so we have this chimney, and I, I don't know how to draw that, but this is our little ganglion trail that's come down through here. And we're going to have some flow of uh, water that goes through here. And it goes through at some volumetric flow rate. So I guess what we could do is we could think of this as a simple system where you take a core and you have that core that looks like this, not the best. Didn't do it any better the, the second time. We have a flow that goes through here and we have we could think of it if you thought of this as either pressure on the top or better as head. We have some kind of gradient of head that goes along the length of it. The length of this thing is some length L. And, um, and the drop in head that occurs on the water table in some length L is just going to be So I don't know what those numbers are. We can put some numbers on them. I could be L as a kilometer. Change in head is a, a meter over a kilometer. That's a, one in a thousand is a small gradient. And so I guess what we might be interested in figuring out is what is the, the downstream loading that you'd get if you pushed fluid through this? And how, how would we calculate what that downstream loading at some compliance point is. So in other words, um, mass flux of dissolved fluid. So what is that? So we can, we can calculate what that would be. How much, in other words, how much is going to get removed from this? Let's say this is an area, and I don't know what that area is. So how do we go about that? Yes? Are we only dealing with the chimney at this point? Yes. Only the stuff that's partly, partly napple saturated. And so it's sitting in there, and all we're going to do, everything's in place, so nothing's moving, but some stuff is flowing through this and across it and out of it. And it will come in clean on the left-hand side and go out less clean with, it, with some loading on the right-hand side. So what is that going to be? Uh, the mass flux of Dean Apple is what? It's going to be uh, a volumetric flow rate, which is in meters cubed per second. Uh, and a concentration, which is in going to be in, say, milligrams per meters cubed of water. So the product of those will be um, 
milligrams per second of loading. So some amount that gets carried, the mass loading downstream. So how much is being removed? So for instance, if you knew how much was here in total, and you knew the rate at which it's being removed, then you could say how long it would take to remediate it, and we'll do those calculations. So to do that, well, we need to know what these two components are. We're a little far away from figuring that out now, but if this was, for instance, TCE, trichloroethylene, then the, um, the loadings would be something of the order of uh, 1,100, say 1,000 uh, milligrams per meter cubed. in terms of the concentration. It doesn't matter what the concentration is. So then what we need to do is we need to figure out what the volumetric flow rate through this is. So how do we figure out what that is? Uh, and so we know that we can calculate the volumetric flow rate is going to be equal to a cross-sectional area, a relative permeability of the wetting fluid, the permeability, the viscosity, since it's water that we're looking at, it's going to be the viscosity of water. And we won't worry about pressure, or we will worry about pressures. And we'll define this in terms of a pressure gradient, since this is in terms of a, um, a, a permeability. I guess we could also write this expression also as if, for instance, we... I don't really want to um, manipulate this, uh, or do I? Um, if we know, for instance, that head is equal to pressure divided by unit weight, then if we divided both sides by uh, unit weight of water and multiply both sides by the unit weight of water, then this term here would all of a sudden be head. And this term uh, here, let me box them off. Let me draw two boxes around here. You remember this fundamental relationship we had was that hydraulic conductivity divided by the unit weight of the fluid is equal to permeability divided by viscosity of the fluid. And so this is one box term here. And this is a second box term here. So if you multiply both sides through by unit weight and unit weight, then these two box terms here merely represent the, the value of hydraulic conductivity. And so we could write this also as the cross-section area of flow, still the relative permeability, which is a dimensionless number, has no units, hydraulic conductivity, and change in head with length. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this term here and this term here and realizing that the product of those two terms just gives us the hydraulic conductivity, and so we can substitute this. So I guess this, this term is just these two box terms. And so the, the bottom equation is by far the easiest one to use. It's by far the easiest one to use because we know, for instance, that, whoops, didn't do that. This is one meter. This is a thousand meters. This is a hydraulic conductivity. I'm going to choose a number. A sand is something of like uh, 10 to the minus 3 meters per second. Ballpark, I don't know, it's a justifiable number. The area is whatever this cross-sectional area is here, which we would calculate if we knew the, the depth of this. So I don't know what to label that. I guess I won't label it. And all we have to do is figure out what this term here is. So how do we do that? Well, I've scribbled a bit too much stuff here, so let me re-go back to this and draw the water table. 
draw the pressure change as a function of depth. Let me draw this cartoon on the left hand side for this squiggle that goes down to the pool. This is the capillary barrier. So all I'm doing is trying to redraw this, just starting here. What do we know? We know that the gradient of pressure of water has to look something like pressure equals unit weight of water times the depth. We know that the pressure change of the napple has to equal uh, the unit weight of the non-wetting fluid times depth. And that the distribution of this is that this is just the capillary pressure. By definition. And so if we know where the water table is, and we go down, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to do um, two meters. Then this is going to be equal to how we could rewrite this as what? Uh, two meters, which is the elevation, multiplied by the difference in these dense uh, unit weights. So the unit weight of water is 9.8 uh, kilonewtons per meter cubed. Kilonewtons per meter cubed. And the density of TC is something like uh, 16, say 15 kilonewtons per meter cubed. So meters cubed times a meter is whatever. So the difference in between these is about 5 multiplied by 2 is about 10 kilonewtons per meter squared. So we know what the, apps, the actual capillary pressure is at that particular depth. It's just the difference between those two multiplied by the, the depth. Because I'm just using these two equations to throw into that. So if we know that, um, and we know this, so if we just take this value of 2 meters as being somewhere in the middle here, just as a reference value to be able to do this calculation, I guess if we're doing that, then the depth of this is going to be 4 meters. Then we have a capillary pressure versus saturation curve that looks like this. And saturations of water are going to be between 1 and 0 and 1, uh, zero and one as fractions. <coughs> and so what we want to do is we want to know where the magnitude of capillary pressure that we've just calculated fits on this, because that allows us to calculate what the saturation is within this here. So if we know exactly what this capillary pressure is, then by definition we know what this, the wetting saturation is in here, and we know what the non-wetting saturation would be, right? because it would be, this would be the wetting saturation. And this would be the non-wetting saturation. And I have the luxury, I guess, of going up one page and carrying on directly underneath it. Hope you, you're not at the bottom of a page. And the other thing that we then know is that we have our capillary pressure versus saturation curves. If we know what those are, again, between 1 and 0, relative saturations between 100% zero and all we're going to do is we're going to take this down here which will be our appropriate saturation and I'm going to draw those limits I guess one limit would be here this would be SW0 
this would be SNW0. And so these would also be on this curve as well. And you know, we saw what they were before. Maybe this is um, what? Maybe this is 85%. Maybe this is 15%. And so now, if we were to draw our relative perm graphs on this, you know, we're talking about getting a ballpark estimate of this. Is it all of a sudden we, we have some numbers? So I guess we've assumed that we have this figure here, right? We assume that we have this um, graph here. We can actually construct it, and actually assignment number three will be to do exactly that, uh, to construct it. But we're assuming we have this, so if we know what this saturation is, then we immediately know where we are on this. And if we want to calculate the flow rate through our system, the amount of water we have going through our system is going to be the cross-sectional area, multiplied by the relative permeability of water, which is going to carry this. The hydraulic conductivity of the system to water and the gradient thousand meters one whoops one meter ten to the minus three meters per second cross-sectional area I guess is going to be what we said it's typically we do things for a, a one meter width of the aquifer and we said we're four meters deep so this would be equal to 4 meters squared, which is this. And the only other parameter we have to figure out is what the relative permeability is. We're looking at the flow of water through here, which is going to carry this dissolved component. If we know the, con the maximum concentration it can ever be in water, it can't get above this. So this is, a, I suppose, a conservative value of what the loading would be. It would be an unconservative value of the removal rate because we might not be able to get to this high concentration. Uh, but if we know this rate of flow, it's going to be the magnitude of this is the relative permeability of water. And that, I guess, would be this, this one here. And you can get this from here. And you can, you can see that from this, it's going to be about 0.3 say 0.2, just choosing a number. And so you can, we can put that together. So we have everything we need to be able to do that calculation with basically no information whatsoever. We know a hydraulic conductivity or a permeability of the system. We have some idea of what the gradient is for the, the head drop across the system. We know how deep the, this component is. We know we can calculate what its saturation is from these capillary pressure magnitudes if we can construct this figure. If we know what the, the relative saturation is, we, we know something at least a little bit about the relative permeabilities. And so we can write a modifier on this to be able to reduce the actual hydraulic conductivity by an appropriate amount. And that's what we need to be able to calculate how much gets taken out. Um, if we knew the total mass in the aquifer, How do we calculate that from the information we have here? So we know, for instance, if we take our component of the aquifer, which is this, which is 1 by 1 by 4 meters, then the mass of the napple is going to be what? We just call mass of the non-wetting. So the mass of the non-wetting is going to be what? It's going to be the volume of the non-wetting multiplied by its density, I guess. So meters cubed times kilograms per meters cubed, I guess, is kilograms. And the volume of the non-wetting is going to be the volume of the aquifer times the porosity. So these two together give you the total volume of the pore space and multiplied by the saturation of 
a non-wedding component. And I think we have all of those. Right? The volume of the aquifer per you know, plan area of one meter is going to be one by one by four. Uh, porosity, well, I don't know, 30 percent, 0 0.3, typical number. We haven't defined it. And this is the non-wetting saturation, which on this would be this amount here. Oh, sorry, this amount here. This is the wetting saturation on this side. And so if we know what this is, which is um, something less than 80% 80, 80 or something, right? So if we have that, then we have this as well. And so if we know the mass that's in there, and if we know the mass removal rate, uh, then we can calculate how long it takes to remove it. So the mass is going to be Per, per unit area is going to be 4 meters cubed times 0 0.3 times 0 0.8 times 1600 kilograms per meter cubed. And the mass removal rate is just going to be uh, the volumetric flow rate, which we would have calculated here, <coughs> multiplied by uh, the, the concentration. And the maximum concentration would be uh, the saturation. Which I think is of the order of... Uh, a thousand uh, milligrams per liter. Yes, milligrams per liter. Not per liter. Yeah. Which is a thousand p ppm. A thousand ppm. Um, and so that allows us to, to do some useful things. So it allows us to, one, to calculate what the flow rates would be through that. If we assume that in the water that's going through there, all of that water has the opportunity to dissolve the, um, the, the non-aqueous fluid at its maximum concentration, we can calculate the mass removal rate. And if we know the mass removal rate and the total amount that's in there from the saturation in that, then we have enough to be able to calculate how long it'll take to do it. And we'll do that calculation later on. But in case you're wondering why we're doing all the things that we're doing, it actually allows us to make some relatively sophisticated calculations with not very much information at all. Uh, we haven't really defined what the capillary pressure versus saturation curves are. Uh, we've assumed that you have that. Uh, you'll have a chance in assignment three to, to actually put one together yourself. But for instance, if you didn't know exactly what that was, we actually do have a way to be able to put them together because we know also that they look a bit like this in terms of saturation between 0 and 1 uh, this, these are the Levert, so-called Levert curves that this is 15% uh, this is 85% And we know that this number here that allows us to orient ourselves is something like 0 0.3 is equal to capillary pressure, interfacial tension, permeability, and porosity. And so of these, we know this. We don't quite know this, but we do know that 
permeability and viscosity are equal to hydraulic conductivity and unit weight. So we know this, we know this, we know this, um, we know this to an order of magnitude. This is 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds, order of magnitude. And so we do have a value for this in terms of hydraulic conductivity. Um, we don't necessarily know what interfacial tension is, but I think we've said that uh, for water and napples aren't much different. It's of the order of two milli newtons per meter. And so if we know what all of these are, the only other term that we don't know is capillary pressure. And we've said that we can calculate capillary pressure just by taking maybe an, an average depth of two meters, which is halfway through our section, if we get the magnitude of the capillary pressure then, then that allows us to be able to calculate what our appropriate saturation is. So if we do know what this is, then everything in this curve we have as well. So we know, uh, yeah. so we know what the capri, how capillary pressures would scale. And so this would actually be the capillary pressure at, so, yeah, right. so I guess that's, that's, that's a red herring. So we know what the permeability is in terms of hydraulic conductivity. We know the porosity is. We know what interfacial tension is. We know this is 0 0.3 when it's the bubbling pressure. And so I suppose we should write this. So what we can calculate then for our particular aquifer is what is the bubbling pressure. If we know what the bubbling pressure is, then we have an actual number to put on this, whatever it is. And say that number is equal to five kilonewtons per meter cubed. Meter squared. So if you know what, if that's the entry pressure, and we know that the capillary pressure in our aquifer is actually 10 kilonewtons per meter squared, then we know that we're scaled up on here at some location, and we can do that basically twice the amount of the bubbling pressure. And so we can figure out exactly what this relative saturation is if we come down here, because we know it on here. Okay? And you know, proof, proof positive of that would be, I guess, if we go back and if I can find it in a hurry, uh, I think it's here, right? This is it right here. So basically what we've done is we've said that we've calculated this is five kilonewtons per meter cubed on this curve. If we look for what our aquifer pressure is, it's going to be up here, right? This length here is roughly the same as this length here. So if this is five, then this would be 10. If this is 10, then we can calculate that in our aquifer, our effective saturation would be 18%. If we know that our effective saturation is 18%, then from these standard figures, as I'm zooming, zooming through here, it's not very well marked, then, um, yeah, can't use it very easy because I guess it's not identified. But I guess what we could do is come back to this and do this calculation here. How, how do we do it? Well, I guess we realize that this is probably 5%. And so what I would do if I was doing this, I would take this cutoff here at 85. And just by geometry, nothing more than geometry, you could draw this figure. You could draw a figure where this is 85. You could draw a figure where this is 5. This is 100. This is 0. 
And if you were to, for instance, draw a line directly between those two points, I guess that's not the one you want. You want the one that's this one. Not a very straight line. And if you know that you are at 18%, then you can calculate exactly what this is just by, by similar triangles, I suppose, right? The similar triangle would be, um, correct me if I'm wrong, this would be 13, 13 to KR versus what this would be between here. This is 18 to 85, so that's 65, 67, same as 67 to 1. And so the angles between these, these are just similar triangles. All I'm doing is, is this triangle here versus this triangle here. And so if you write KR over 13 has to equal 1 over 67. And so multiply both sides by 13, and you end up with relative permeability. So I don't know what that is. Looks like it is 20%, right? Something like 20%, which sounds about right. So the only point I'm trying to make is that from basically no information, a porosity, a hydraulic conductivity, a slope of the water table, you're basically able to calculate um, what the rates of flow, fluid flow would be through those to relatively decent order, to calculate if you know something about the saturation, the maximum loading that dissolved components can be carried in water, you can calculate the saturation. The product of those gives you the mass that's removed per unit time and is then transported downstream which isn't very much use except for knowing that the concentration would be the, ma the solubility limit downstream. Uh, and finally, if you know how much is removed and you can calculate from the saturation how much is in place there, you can calculate how long it takes to remove it. And so those are calculations that allow you to make actually quite sophisticated um, evaluations with basically no, no data. And so I thought that was a useful thing to, to go through. Okay. All right, so what now? Well, what is a, a maybe um, an exposition of this? So here are some laboratory results from uh, a column test. And so all it is is a column that has had, and actually you'll get a chance to do an example just like this. a bead pack that sits inside a <coughs> column which has water flowed through it at some rate, Q. The same rate of water going in comes out, but in this intermediate portion there's this um, portion which has napple in it. So it's actually a bit like ours. In fact, the, the geometry we had was a little different, right? We had a, a water table, a capillary barrier, this region in between, and so we thought of our flow system as basically being this. <coughs> this is our zone of Napple. Water goes in, comes out, comes out with a different concentration. And so this is looking at, at that behavior from our system uh, along the length of this particular uh, bead pack. And so these are the data. They're not particularly great data, uh, but this is the length from the upstream to the downstream. And I don't know whether you can see this, you probably can't, I know it's there. So this is what the concentration looks like. So it flows in upstream, it flows into the top of the bead pack, the, the napple area is this zone here, and so as water 
is pushed into here. It raises the concentration of the NAPL, which is dissolved in the water, from a small concentration to a progressively larger concentration at different times. So this is increasing time. So this is after three days. It's gone so that the whole pulse of this thing has reached downstream. So if you're drinking water coming out of this end, the concentration of that water would be a relative concentration of 100% of the dissolved component. So this would be, in our case, 1,000 a milligrams per liter of TCE coming out dissolved in water. If you keep on flowing through here, then it will stay at this rate for a longer period of time. So this is the same graph that just continues. But as you physically remove the mass which is present here, there will be less and less to dissolve, so that close to the end, finally, the concentration will ultimately go down to basically to, to zero levels because it's all dissolved from the system. So it'll start off, it'll rise, it'll come out at some high concentration, it will endure over time. So I suppose if you looked at the concentration changing as a function of time at this compliance point, it would do this. Go up, continue, and then ultimately you'd have this tail attached to it. And uh, this amount underneath this curve is the proportional to the amount of mass that you're removing from the system. What's going to happen to this? Uh, what's going to control the, the dynamics of this system as it works? So what's the relative permeability going to be of this system? Well, initially it will have a relative per permeability of some magnitude because the saturation the saturation in this is going to be some magnitude. So this is the, the NAPL zone. It's saturation. So it starts off, I think it's 17% in this particular example. It doesn't matter what it is. And it goes down to 0%. As you physically dissolve stuff and carry it downstream, then the saturation has to decrease because it's physically being removed. It's being removed from the upstream portion and carried downstream. But at successive time levels, I don't know, 60 days, doesn't matter what it is, 1,000 days, basically the saturation is gone. If you look at a capillary pressure, a relative permeability curve, uh, between 1 and 0, uh, and it goes between a saturation of zero to one. Let's not worry about the these little no-go regions at the end. Let's just do it as a straight line because it makes li our life a little easier. If the initial saturation of the NAPL is 17 percent, what is the the relative permeability when it starts out to water? So we don't know the pressure, but we know what the saturation begins at. If the saturation begins at 17%, then we could presumably do our calculation for the flow rate, which is equal to area, <coughs> relative perm, absolute perm, and pressure drop. So we can do that calculation to say how much is being taken out of the system. If we know that our initial saturation is 17%, then I guess on this curve, that would mean what in terms of our water saturation? So this is 100%. This is the relative saturation of the non-wetting fluid would be... This would be 17%. And so I guess if that were the case, what would we expect that our relative permeability to water would be? Any takers? I think if it was this curve, it would be 83%. The relative permeability to water would be 83%, just by geometry, right? You go 13% in this direction, so you come 13% down here. Sorry, 17% in this direction, so you come 17% down here. 
and this would be 87. I don't think it quite is that from this. Uh, starting apart. So I guess from that we would presume that uh, the capillary pressure saturation curve is a little different, but anyway. But as we start removing this material and the saturation of this is decreasing, each of these, they're curves, right? But you could also think of them just as a, an average saturation at time one, time two, and time three. So these are clearly decreasing. And so if this is decreasing, then we're traveling along this trajectory to get to 100% saturation. So in other words, we'd start off at some low relative permeability, and slowly over time it would increase until we're at 100% relative permeability, and there'd be no impedance in this left whatsoever, and therefore we'd expect that the flow through this would be completely unimpeded. And so it's just physically representing the system that we've been looked at. What would we expect the pressure distribution or the head distribution to look like along that length as we go through this? Can we rationalize what that would be? Um, if you think about this, as being our plug, and this is a relative permeability which is um, different as we go across it. What do we know? We know that flow rate is equal to, let's not write it equal to an area, a permeability by viscosity, and a pressure gradient, which is the same as being able to write an area, a hydraulic conductivity, and a head gradient. It's working her heads. So we know that if you take a section along the pipe here, or here, or here, then the areas are the same. We know that if it's in steady state, this always has to be the same value and constant. And so if we reduce the value of the hydraulic conductivity, then to keep this value the same, then the gradient has to rise. And so if we have an area which is a lower permeability, then we think that if you look across this section, that I'm going to erase this, that initially Low permeability means a high gradient. The highest gradient we could get, you could imagine, would look like this. And so you'd expect that the head distribution probably could look something like this, right? exaggerating it. So if the permeability is low in this region here, then the hydraulic gradient has to be highest, this, dh dx. And all of the, the losses along this pipe occur in this region of high frictional losses, basically, is what it is, and almost none above it. That happens if this is infinitely large, it would be exactly this form. If this K1 is not very much bigger than K2, then it would actually be much flatter than this. And so I'm going to get rid of that curve. And so initially, in this flow system, when the permeability here is a little bit lower than on either sides, then the initial distribution of heads would look like this. So it satisfies this idea that in the area where it's not very easy to flow, you have to have a high pressure gradient or head gradient driving flow. And on the upstream and downstream slides, there's not so much head loss. But what's going to happen as we physically start removing this occluding fluid? Slowly we start removing it, so the saturation reduces. As the saturation of this occluding fluid reduces, we move up this relative permeability curve to 100% water saturation. So hydraulic conductivity slowly increases, gets larger. And when it gets to this point, it's the same here as it is in the middle. And at this point, then it would just be a straight I can't draw it. 
it would be a straight line that goes through all these points. And I don't know if you can see, I'm trying to do just a straight line between upstream and downstream. So in other words, the pressures that here that are higher will migrate downwards. The pressures here that will lower will migrate upwards to just the straight line that goes through here. And you're left with just a single straight line that goes through. So we know that the gradient across it, if the hydraulic conductivity is the same, by definition, has to be just a straight line. So if I exaggerate it here, then this is the area of initially low permeability. Then the, the head across the length of it would initially look like this. As you physically remove some of this material, it's anchored upstream, it's anchored downstream, and so then it would look like this, maybe. And then ultimately, the steady behavior would be just a terrible diagram. Distribution. So the initial one is this. And the final one would be just a straight line. And in between that, there would be a whole bunch of rearrangements at every single time step. And so it's a useful example because it actually illustrates many of the things that we've talked about so far. We've been talking about multiphase flow. We've been talking about how multiphase flow is controlled by relative permeabilities, how we can calculate the flow rates from relative permeability versus saturation curves, but the fact that we need to orient, orient ourselves on those curves relative to what the saturations would be. And to calculate what those saturations would be, we need to know something about capital pressures. So if you like, what we've done today is really a workflow to be able to follow through exactly this example of figuring out how to get um, to calculate how much would flow through this, this region here. So what else? All right. So we didn't really talk about much of the stuff that I had planned. Um, this is really the, the end stuff from last time. But actually, we've demonstrated probably uh, in better detail by doing, I guess, rather than talking about exactly what uh, would happen. And so maybe it's enough to be able to just talk about an overview about the behaviors of these systems in terms of what the saturation profiles would look like, both by looking at NAPLs, L-NAPLs, and also D-NAPLs. And so I think we've covered so much ground that we can do that. We don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need this. But we can look at this. Uh, well, let's look at this picture. Oops. So if you take a soil column and you were to, uh, into this soil column, spill uh, gasoline, uh, when initially it has a, a water table at some location, then this is what we'd expect the uh, saturation profile to look at. Like, you notice that here we use, this is out of Fetter's book, it's defined in terms of water content. So you remember that water content by definition uh, theta is equal to uh, volume of water <coughs> over total, total volume of the aquifer, whereas saturation is equal to uh, the volume of water <coughs> divided by porosity, the volume of voids. So in other words, when the volume of water is equal to the volume of voids, the saturation is 100%. When the volume of water reaches saturation in this particular case, this would be saturation. Saturation of water equals 1. Then the volumetric moisture content is actually equal to the porosity. You can figure it out from, from these. So in other words, this means that it's fully saturated. So this means, in this case, that this, the porosity of this particular aquifer is 
to about point three two. Just just this number. Point one, point two, point three. Looks like it's about point two. And so all of these are just a series of snapshots at zero time, 120 minutes after you dump this in, uh, 480 minutes. So what's that? That's uh, eight hours. And then finally. So you put this stuff in. This is the initial profile. This is the water content profile. This would be the amount of water. This would be the... Oh, okay. So I didn't see this. So there's an irreducible saturation here of, of uh, some amount. So this would be uh, air. And then we put some oil on the top. So then this changes so that if you go across any particular part here. Try and draw a straight line, not a dashed line. Actually, let me, let me not do it here. Let, let me do it here. If we go across here, then what are these different proportions? This is the amount that is air filled. This is the amount that is oil filled. And this is the amount that is water filled. And so if you make this whole length here equal to 1, which it isn't, I guess, it's equal to 0.4, if you made this equal to 1, then the relative lengths of these would be equal to the saturation. So the saturation of air is 80%, the saturation of oil is 18%, and the saturation of water is 2%. So you get that. And as this uh, continues, then it rearranges itself. And so you can see that if you look around here in this final form, because it's been buoyed by the stuff that it's attempting to sit on top of, if you now draw a straight line through this, this represents air, this represents oil, and this represents water. And so if you physically drew that as a, a schematic of what you thought that would look like, then I think it doesn't look so different from exactly what we've been drawing. A, a lens of infinite width, it doesn't have to peter out at any particular location, that sits on top of a water table that is water underneath, and at the surface would be mainly air-filled, but it has a chimney that's attached to it that is mainly air with a little bit of water and with a, a little bit more of oil that's here. And so that would be this, this kind of region, this chimney, if you like, that gets attached to this. And so all of the things we've talked about in terms of capillary pressure versus saturation curves, and of course you realize that this is drawn now as an elevation, but it could be equally well defined as a capillary pressure, right? Going upwards from this, this is the bubbling pressure, etc. Is that this allows us to be able to formulate exactly what these distributions of saturation are in place. And so that, if you like, is one of our goals in being able to, to do that. And so we don't need to spend, I guess all of the other stuff is just the narrative that explains that, that behavior. If you look at Dean Apples, just to, to finalize case. I'm skipping through a decent amount of this. Oh no, I don't want to do that. Um, if, yeah, let, let me do what I was going to talk about. If you look at Dean apples, then you get exactly the same behavior as we've talked about today, in that if you look at... Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to finish this off in, in its entirety. And so one piece of information that we might like to figure out would be, just to kill this off, is to be what might be this amount of product that we have in place. 
to be able to figure out what's doing that. We said that there's one way to do it by basically taking an average saturation and just uh, multiplying that by uh, the height of the aquifer to find out what's in the, the chimney of that average saturation. But we might also be interested to be able to figure out exactly what the, the depth of this might be that's in, in situ. And so one way to do that would be to drill a hole that goes down through this and to look at the level of water and gasoline that ends up existing in that hole. But there's a small problem with that in that if you look at what those magnitudes would be, then in our particular aquifer, we have uh, the water, we have the gasoline that sits on top of the water, and what we know is that the, the magnitude of the column of the gasoline that would drain out of the aquifer and into the borehole may not be the same as the thickness of it that exists in the aquifer. And the reason for that is that this tube is a big tube and therefore doesn't have any capillary effects in it. The capillary diameters in this material are small and therefore there are capillary effects that are included in this. And so if you go into a borehole and you measure the actual thickness of the free product that might exist in this borehole, then it may or may not be equal to the amount of free product which is present in the aquifer. And so the question is, are we able to figure out exactly what the difference is between those two, two magnitudes? And we can do a relatively simple calculation. And that is to be able to uh, look at the magnitudes of the weight the depth of material that exists in the aquifer, which we'll call W. Uh, sorry, the, dif the difference in these depths. This depth here is W, which is the difference between the height of the napple in the aquifer and the depth of the base of that layer within the borehole. And what we can do is we can merely do a force balance. And the force balance is this, is that because this sit, stuff sits on top of the water table and is explained by this, so these are the pressure profiles that develop within the water table as you put this slug of gasoline on top of this. Initially there's no gasoline, the water table by definition is at atmospheric pressure zero gauge pressure and this is in tension directly above it and in compression as you go down below it. As you add the gasoline on the top you get this little nose of gasoline developing and it uh, depresses the stuff below it until ultimately you end up with a gasoline table here sitting on top of a water table. So the water table is just the projection of the pressures in the water as they come up to the zero pressure line. And this represents, by definition, atmospheric pressure, which is the definition of the water table. But on top of the gasoline, there's also another place where there's atmospheric pressure, which is, if you like, the oil table. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to calculate exactly what this thickness here is, and I suppose in our nomenclature, this thickness is what we'll call T minus W. <coughs> T is the height of this in the well, and W is the height of the, uh, the water table above the base of this portion in the well. That, that's what we're attempting to do. And so what we know is that in the well, the pressures here have to be the same. And so just by very straightforwardly equating two pressures, the pressure of the oil in the well bore has to be acting downwards. The pressure of water below it has to be acting upwards. The pressure 
of the oil has to be equal to the density of the oil, its height multiplied by gravity. So this is just the same as, I guess, the unit weight of the well times the oil times T. The pressure acting up has to be the pressure in the water acting up here. And that has to be equal to the height of water below the water table, which is W, multiplied by the unit weight of water, which is the product of these two components. And since we know that these have to be equal to each other, we can just equate them, and we get a simple ratio. And all this simple ratio says is that this W, not, not this, this height here, we can calculate if we measure the depth of the free product in the well, and if we know something about the relative densities of these. Density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. What's gasoline? Is it 600? I'm not sure. Something of that order. It certainly floats on water. We know that. I don't know if it's as low as 600, but it's of that order. And so we know that we could calculate if we know that this is a meter, then this would be 60 centimeters in this particular case. So we can calculate that. So we can go into the well. We can measure exactly what the magnitude of the uh, thickness of the free product is just by using a depth meter. They come in a variety of forms. It's typically a little probe that you drop down the well on a string. The light goes on when it finds this surface and this surface just by measuring the electrical resist resistivities of these two components. It gives you a depth of the free product. If we know the depth of the free product, we can calculate what, from the apparent depth of the free product what the real depth of the free product. And if we want to know then what the actual amount present in place would be, then if we know the actual thickness, then we can calculate the amount in place. So the, the amount of free product is going to be the difference between the measured depth minus the corrected depth of the water table. The cross-sectional area of the aquifer in plan view will give us an air, a volume. So these two together give us a volume of the aquifer. If you multiply the volume of the aquifer by the porosity, that gives you the void volume. So this together is the volume of the voids. And if you know the amount of the void space which is filled with the product, it has to be, it can't be more than 1 minus the irreducible saturation of water. This is the amount of water that's left in the place. And so if we know the void volume and 1 minus the irreducible saturation of water, it's going to be a number slightly less than 1. It's probably going to be 85%. Then we can calculate how much free product we have within our system. And therefore, we can remove that. Okay? So, um, I only mention this because it's a relatively easy calculation to do. If you go to um, Fetter's book, you'll find that you can spend about uh, 10 pages of derivations basically doing the same <coughs> calculation. So the same calculation that you can basically get from this as to the amount of free product that might be present in the aquifer and the amount of free product that you might be able to remove, which is exactly the same number as this, except for this additional term here, right? You can't get all the free product out of the system. And you can calculate that from this very simple calculation. So hopefully, uh, there are examples that there are certainly examples that are common things that you'd like to know. How much in in place? How long does it take to remove? How much water will flow through this? We're assuming in all cases that the denapple is locked in there and is not able to remove because it's residual. But these give you a way to be able to calculate all of those components. Okay.